Have a great summer, everybody. And, and uh, this is Dr. Martirano. I echo, echo those same responses. So, Lele, you've been a joy to work with. And Ms. Renault, we look forward to working with you, and I can speak on behalf of Mr. Lamont as our lay is on. Thank you, thank you for everything you've done. Okay, thank you. And we're moving to our presentation of feasibility study. Mr. Lubeli and Mr. Rogers. Uh, uh, board members, I'm gonna provide a couple opening comments and we'll get right into this. Uh, once again, good evening, board members. We've had a very busy evening. Momentarily, staff are going to present the 2021 feasibility study. This report initiates many of the conversations and considerations related to the capital budget process, student enrollment projections, changes to the capital projects, and currently anticipated attendance area adjustments. The 2021 feasibility study recommends no boundary review process in 2021 for the implementation in the 2022-2023 school year. This year's feasibility study does foreshadow the work that will begin this year in preparation for the boundary adjustment process that will occur in 2022 to open High School 13 and the Talbot Springs Elementary replacement. However, it will be next year's study that will provide projections and considerations for the boundary adjustment process associated with the opening of the new high school number 13 and Talbot Springs Elementary School replacement for implementation in the 2023-2024 school year. I wanna emphasize board members that the, point, that the point that the feasibility study indicates needs and informs the capital improvement plan, which accounts for the budget limitations. Needs evolve over the time and the annual recommendations must reflect the needs as they exist currently. In the past, the feasibility study identified needs primarily based on capacity. I commend staff for the foresight to further plan for other needs in the school system, such as special education and regional program classrooms needs, as well as addition of regional program centers. Board members, at this time, I will hand this off to staff who will present the 2021 feasibility study. Thank you very much, staff. Thank you, Dr. Martirano, and good evening, Dr. Wu, Board of Education members, Ms. Turner Little. I am Dan Lubley, Director of Capital Planning and Construction. Joining me this evening is Mr. Scott Washington, Chief Operating Officer, and Mr. Tim Rogers, Manager of School Planning. This evening, we are here to present to you the 2021 Feasibility Study. While the school, while the school system and the board has recently concluded the fiscal year 2022 budget process, the feasibility study is the starting point and a resource as we begin the capital planning process for fiscal year 2023. This presentation tonight will highlight the school system's needs within the next 10 year planning process. As Dr. Moderano noted, it is important to note that the 2021 feasibility study does not contain boundary change options for implementation in school year 22 and 23. The study does provide input on the upcoming boundary adjustment process for school year 23-24 with the opening of new Talbot Springs for school year 22-23 and new high school 13 in school year 23-24. A boundary review is recommended to begin this winter and progress through 2022. Next slide. The feasibility study is a comprehensive review of the 10 year student enrollment projections for the school system. It is an annual planning document that begins each cycle of the capital budget process. It provides a new enrollment projection, proposes adjustments and additions to the capital improvement program and long range master plan, considers strategies to address enrollment growth or decline for the school system, and follows the guidance of policy 6010 school attendance areas. The projections presented in this document are based on the most current available data, including population growth based on student yield from sale of existing houses and projected new housing units, birth records and student data. The capital planning process is an 18 month process that starts in January of the first year and ends with the school capacity charts used for APFO in the early summer of the second year. Next slide. The projection is the foundation for the planning in the feasibility study and the capital budget. Development of the annual enrollment projection occurs in the winter. We collect data from HCPSS as well as state and local agencies, and then use our geographic information system or GIS 
to aggregate the data by school to ensure we gain school level insight about trends. The data is used to project the September 30th enrollment for the following school year and beyond. We use historic cohort survival rates, which look at past student population patterns within the county to construct survival ratios in projecting the particular grades progression through the school system. The yellow highlight in this graphic shows a cohort of students moving through the system starting in year one as kindergartners. This particular cohort is exhibiting a growth trend as you can see students are joining the cohort each year. We divide the new enrollment by the previous year to get the ratio. We collect his, uh, histories of these ratios and apply these histories to make our projection for future enrollment. In addition to calculation and application of cohort survival ratios, the HCPSS utilizes many data points in order to project student population, including live birth data, permits for newly constructed homes, resales of existing homes, apartment turnover, and enrollment at regional programs. Each data point is projected separately based on specific appropriate methodologies for each category. A key point that should be emphasized is that for our methodology homes are only considered new construction in their first year. This can lead to a misconception that newly construction or new construction only has a one year impact on school enrollment. After the first year, the new students generated by homes constructed in the previous years are counted as preschool age move-ins or in cohort survival or resales for purpose of calculating historic student yield rates to inform projections. So the new construction impacts not only the first year, but each year after. Now, Mr. Rogers will go over the information provided within the, within the 2021 feasibility study in a little more detail. Uh, good evening, everyone. Tim Rogers, Manager of School Planning. Um, student enrollment for the school year 2020-2021 did not reach expected levels due to impacts of the pandemic. Instead of increasing as projected, enrollment decreased. We expect enrollment will rebound in the coming years as we continue in a time of growth in Howard County. To demonstrate this, we have displayed the decreases and increases of the student enrollment over the last three enrollment periods. New students in the blue bar arrive in HCPSS each year and are mainly from new homes, resales, and kindergarten students enrolling in HCPSS for the first time. The exiting group of students shown in the orange bar includes those graduating or students who have moved from the school district. In 2020, we experienced a net loss of 1,231 students for a decrease of approximately 2%. For comparison, the enrollment increase from 2018 to 2019, as shown above, was 948 for a 1.7% rate of increase. From 2010 to 2019, on average, the school system added 781 new students per year. However, since 2017, there has been a slight decline in the level of growth of new student enrollment. Based on updated information used in this year's projection, we expect this trend to continue. Our office reviews and updates our projections each year to incorporate the latest data and trends related to all of the factors that contribute to our projection. For this reason, projections vary from year to year. The large chart above shows the projected countywide enrollment for the years 2021 to 2025 as presented in projections developed between 2017 and 2021, the last five annual projections. Since 2017, the trend data has indicated declining rates of enrollment growth when compared to earlier projections. The smaller chart shows the projected enrollment increase between school year 2020-21 and school year 2021-22 from the previous five projections. This further illustrates how the annual update process allows us to fine tune projections for the near term and how longer term projections can have larger error, but are still important for planning. HCPSS 10 year K through 12 projected enrollment for school year 2021, 22 through 2030 continues to show enrollment growth at all levels. New, new seats are still needed. Investment in capital projects will need to continue as we catch up from recent growth and address projected future growth. 
It is anticipated that for school year 2021-22, we will recover most of the enrollment decrease from 2020, in addition to continued enrollment growth due to housing and factors discussed earlier. The projection for school year 2021-22 shows a net increase of 2,043 students over school year 2020-21 excuse me, 2020-21 enrollment, which is comparable to the increases from previous projections. Over the next 10 years, the school system is projected to grow by approximately 5,300 new students at all levels. The trend in the 2020 projection is for elementary enrollment to increase by 3,200 students, for middle enrollment to increase by nearly 720 students, and for high school enrollment to increase by nearly 1,900 students by 2030. Over the past 10 years, the countywide projection error rate has ranged from 0.05% to 0.6%. As presented to the board in February of this year, the error rate for the school year 2020-21 projection was 3.5%. This higher error rate was due to withdrawals and delayed entries due to the COVID-19 pandemic. We expect to return to our previous levels of accuracy as we recover from the effects of the pandemic. As stated earlier, adjustments were made to our projection to account for a recovery of student enrollment from 2020. Equitable evaluation of the impact of projected enrollment growth requires accurate representation of school capacities. Capacities are not necessarily fixed to the capacity designed when a school building first opened. Change in space usage, program location, and building or program specifications can change capacity. Capacity methodologies have been reviewed for program expansions. The results of those capacity studies are the baseline, for recalculation of capacities due to relocation of regional programs, additions, or renovations. For school year 2021-22, as in previous years, the expansion of several special education programs and early childhood programs necessitated recalculation of capacity at some schools. These changes are included in the post-measure charts in the feasibility study in order to compare between the end of school year 2020-21 and the beginning of school year 2021-22. We'd like to note that these capacities were calculated based on proposed fiscal year 22 operating budget and may be further adjusted as review of program needs and placements continues. For school year 2021-22, we're projecting 10 elementary schools to be utilized above the target range of 90 to 110%. Capital projects, including the replacement of Talbot Springs Elementary and three new elementary schools are critical pieces of the strategy to provide needed seats as enrollment continues to increase. Boundary reviews related to each of these projects will enable relief of surrounding schools. New capacity at Talbot Springs should be used for relief of schools in Eastern Columbia, including Athleton, Cradle Rock, and Phelps Luck. New elementary number 43 in the Southeast should provide relief to several schools, including Bowman Bridge, Forest Ridge, Corman Crossing, Guilford, Hammond, and Hanover Hills. New elementary number 44 in the Northwest should provide needed relief from Manor Woods, Waverly, and West Friendship elementaries and possibly extend to St. John's Lane and Veterans. In Western Columbia, recent boundary adjustments and lower than expected student yields from Columbia Town Center have had a positive impact on capacity utilization in this area. Several of these schools have portables and at this time we're recommending exploration of options for a regional early childhood and special ed center in this area, possibly allowing existing early childhood classrooms to be repurposed. Projections will be closely monitored for consideration of a new elementary school in this area as well. At the middle school level, we're projecting three schools to be utilized above target range for school year 2020-21. Since the crowding is more geographically distributed at this level, instead of new schools, additions are recommended for schools with crowding concerns or that are in need of renovation. As planning begins for each of these projects, it will be important to maximize the potential for adding capacity to the schools. Thomas Viaduct Middle is projected to be utilized at 130% for school year 2021-22. Portables are being installed there and other options within the building are being explored. Previous feasibility studies recommended an addition along with the needed renovation at Oakland Mills Middle to provide relief. In order, to more efficiently address the crowding at Thomas Viaduct and minimize boundary disruptions, 
a 250 seat addition at Thomas Viaduct Middle School was recommended. With boundary adjusted adjustments, the addition to Dunlog in Middle School could provide relief to Burley Manor, Mount View, and Folly Quarter Middle Schools. Additional relief for these schools comes from an addition renovation at Patapsco Middle School. Until these projects can be completed, the need for relocatable classrooms will be reviewed annually with additional units placed as needed. At the high school level, boundary adjustments adopted in 2019 provided some relief to the most crowded schools using Western capacity. Four of our 12 high schools are projected to be over target utilization for school year 2021-22. Depending on the scope of boundary adjustments for the opening of high school number 13, along with the addition to Hammond High School, crowding could be addressed at any or all of these schools. Potential high school number 13 boundaries reviewed in 2019 followed two main patterns. If a more linear boundary following Route 1 to the Northeast is adopted, Relief will be focused on Hammond, Longreach, and Howard High Schools with secondary adjustments to other schools to balance utilization. If the high school number 13 boundary is more compact, staying in the Southeast, then Hammond, Oakland Mills, and Reservoir would see primary, primary relief with other schools seeing relief from secondary adjustments. Recommended additions at Centennial High School and Oakland Mills High School could provide additional relief coupled with needed renovations. With focused boundary adjustments, Mount Hebron and Marriott's Ridge could see crowding relief from additional capacity at Centennial High School, while Longreach and Howard would be the primary beneficiaries of additional seats at Oakland Mills High School. Of course, these strategies include focus, focused and effective boundary reviews to achieve improved capacity utilization at adjacent schools. In the interim, most of the schools shown on this slide already have relocatable classrooms and all schools will be reviewed annually for a placement of additional relocatable classrooms. At this, time, at this time, projections indicate the possible need for a 14th high school in the early to mid 2030s. Since this need is indicated in the latter years of our projection, the most effective use of this information is in long range planning and property acquisition efforts. Uh, Mr. Ludwig. Based on the needs and strategies just noted, this figure explores new capacity projects at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. Specifically, this figure shows key changes from the 2020 feasibility study and recommended timing of planned and proposed capacity projects. Here are some of the highlights. The Talbot Springs replacement, new High School 13, and Hammond High School renovation addition are currently under construction and are scheduled to be completed in 2022 for Talbot Springs and 2023 for High School 13 and Hammond High School. Dunlog and Middle School is recommended to increase the additional seats from 195 to 233. New Elementary School number 43 shows a capacity of 600 K through 5 seats with the inclusion of regional program seats. Additions at Thomas Viaduct Middle School and Worthington Elementary have been added to address specific capacity needs and regional program seats are recommended at new elementary school 44, which is recommended to be located in the Northwest. Due to the revised projections, projected needs and strategies, the added seats capacity at Oakland Mills Middle School and new elementary school 45 are needed at later dates and new elementary school 45 is recommended to be in the Columbia area. Next slide. As Dr. Monterano noted, the 2021 feasibility study does not recommend the feasibility, does not recommend boundary review process within 2021 for implementation in school year 22-23. The study does foreshadow the upcoming boundary adjustment process to begin this winter and spring and continue through 2022. Included in the process will be the attendance areas for the opening of Talbot Springs Elementary School in 2022. The new school will add approximately 160 seats, providing the opportunity to provide to improve crowding at Cradle Rock, Phelps Luck, and Atholton Elementary School through the boundary review. The map shown here for Talbot Springs Elementary and the following for new high school 13 are not boundary recommendations, instead are probability maps that display areas with a high and moderate probability of being affected by this boundary review. Next slide. 
Also in the construction phase, new high school 13 is scheduled to add 1,658 seats in 2023 for school year 23-24. Hammond High School Edition is scheduled to open the same year, adding 200 seats of capacity. High School 13 will be within the current Hammond High School attendance area, requiring major boundary adjustments in the southeast. This map shows the areas with high, moderate, and fair probability of being affected by this boundary review based on the hypothetical plans developed and presented during the 2019 boundary review process. Next slide. In conclusion, the 2021 feasibility study puts forth updates to the capacity need strategies, prepares for the upcoming, upcoming boundary review process, and furthers the discussion on the growing needs for the regional programs. We would like to thank you for your attention and welcome any questions that you may have at this time. Thank you, um, Mr. Rogers and Mr. Lovely. So board members, please raise your hand if you have any questions. I think I saw Ms. Cotronio, right? Ms. Cotronio, go. Um, first of all, um, I just want to thank you for this report and um, especially to Mr. Rogers for um, his work collaborating with me on some data that I'd asked for um, as part of my work on the HOCO by design. Um, it was mentioned in the initial comments about um, what new construction means and I think that that number has been sort of um, misused um, by the, the development community and policymakers, the con new construction lasts, the impact of it lasts more than a year. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, we've been, you know, this, this narrative of, oh, you know, it, 23 students from um, a big um, development like Howard Square, when in reality, it's 149 students, that's the enrollment. Yes, the, the, the data that the school system uses to project that yearly number, that's correct, but when it's used by outside entities um, to, um, to uh, make their own narrative, it, it kind of gets lost and it just becomes fact that, oh, it, there's not that big of an um, impact on enrollment from these, from these projects. And so I just wanna thank Mr. Rogers for um, working with me on that. I think it's been eye-opening for a lot of people and I hope that we can have this conversation at the county level because without understanding the real impact of new construction um, as we go forward, we are going to keep ending up where we are right now, woefully short of seats. Um, and it's, uh, we're always just trying to chase that capacity and not having enough money to do so. Um, so my next, that was just my little speech. I am gonna actually have some questions here. Um, the, the Thomas Viaduct addition was kind of a surprise because that's our newest middle school. And I understand that the, the capacity there is 130%, but again, the other projects fall off and it's our, it's our um, older schools, like Golden Mills Middle, um, Patapsco, Dunlogan, that um, get delayed and delayed. And especially, um, I think in this case, it's Oakland Mills Middle. So, and also going back to Thomas Viaduct, there's not a lot of room there. I mean, I was concerned about putting another portable there. Um, never mind a 250 seat addition. That was only supposed to be one school site. That was supposed to be an elementary school site. Now it's an elementary in the middle, and we're going to put an addition onto it. And uh, that's just, it just seems like a lot in that one little area. So I'm wondering why put the addition at Thomas Viaduct when we can put an addition at Oakland Mills Middle? and get that desperately needed renovation at the same time, because I don't know what we're pushing it out to now. It's, was it 2032 for Oakland Mills Middle? And they've been waiting since 2009. Um, just, I, I, I don't understand why, how, we, how Thomas Viaduct suddenly appeared on the, on the long range plan, as it's our newest school. Thank you for that question, Ms. Catrino. Again, this is Dan, the Director it. of Capital <laughs> Planning and Construction. Um, and I'll ask Mr. Rogers to expound on this a little bit more. But it's the feasibility study provides a look at the needs and possible strategies. And you are correct. As we take a look at adding the seats potentially to Thomas Viaduct, it removes those seats from um, Oakland Mills Middle School. And as we've noted um, several times, when we take a look at the capital budget, 
that's one of our largest challenges that we have in our capital budget is the challenge between providing capacity and our maintenance and renovations. Um, so what the feasibility study is doing is trying to take a look at a strategy that would help to address quicker that 130% utilization that you pointed out. Um, Mr. Rogers, would you like to add any further clarification? Uh, you, Mr. Lubley, you, you summed it up well, and, and I think um, the, the strategy here, another point I'd like to make is a response to um, some of the, the major boundary reviews that we've had in the recent past where um, capacity to provide needed relief for lies a few schools away, um, resulting in some, some major upheaval to school boundaries. So uh, one of the advantages of recommending this addition um, at the school that needs the seats the most um, is the possibility that it could provide direct relief without needed boundary adjustments. And again, it's, you know, we keep talking about development polygons and, you know, that that might be where this comes in, where we just say, you know what, we need to take care of the schools we have um, and where there's capacity, the new students can be um, transported um, because it just seems um, really, it's really worrisome that we're pushing out these renovation projects at our older schools further and further out. Um, on, the, uh, on the subject of middle schools, we have that piece of property on Marysville Road. Are we ever, I mean, it just seems like we don't want to use it. <laughs> I mean, we're, I calculate it's like 642 seats worth of addition, additional seats in additions instead of just building a new school. Um, I'm just wondering, are we just, it really seems like we don't want to use that piece of property or it's not a very good piece of property that we own. And Again, this is Dan Lubley, Director of Capital Planning and Construction. The use of that property is definitely a strategy that can be explored. Um, initially, the thought at the middle school level was to address, to address the capacity needs at the individual schools. Um, as you take a look at trying to develop a property and bring utilities to it and do further development, that can look at a larger project with regards to the, the overall project cost. Um, that obviously has a fiscal constraint to it, but you are correct. We do have that property in the Northwest. It is not a bad property. It is a property that would be uh, well suited for a middle school and can be a strategy that the board can investigate further for the middle school seat needs. Okay, um, I have just one more question, then I'll see the floor because I could I could be here all night. Um, mentioned in your in the feasibility study and in prior memos from Dr. Martirano are regional child care programs, um, and that seems to free up elementary space, and that seems to be um, something that's coming up more frequently. Um, I do think that we need to start exploring that. And one of the thing I guess from a memo from Dr. Martirano back uh, June of last year was about maybe making some of our elementary schools the regional early child care centers. Is that something that the board should be really looking at and as we plan this, um, maybe schools that aren't utilized as much and, and because it's a lot of seats that are being used by early child care that could be freed up and, and provide some much needed capacity in some of our schools. Yes, ma'am. The in this feasibility study, we really did want to progress the discussion of the need for the regional programs and even the regional program centers, as you're, as you're noting. Um, with some of the newer schools like elementary school 43, uh, we're looking at the strategy of providing the K through five seat needs, but then also added a capacity specifically for a regional program. Uh, we did take a look at doing uh, individual regional centers, potentially at property we currently own. And as you pointed out, that would give us the opportunity to claim the current classrooms in existing schools back for capacity. So we do believe that this is, these are multiple different avenues of the same strategy that we and the board can investigate further as we go forward to not only help the growing need for the regional programs, but also potentially the capacity needs. Um, do we need to have extra meat or do we need to have some sort of um, pre um, boundary adjustment meetings to talk about these boundary lines for high school 13? I mean, it seems like we'll, 
we should have some preliminary discussions in public about this. And I, I, don't, I know that's a different conversation, but I just wanted to see if any of my colleagues were interested in that or how we proceed with this, because I don't want us to wait until we um, make, until we're in the throes of it before we start having preliminary discussions, because I think a, a boundary line up and down Route 1 is not very palatable to uh, at least a few of my colleagues. Um, but it seems like we're really limited in that regard in that area. So I'm just wondering, is that something that we should do, or do we wait until um, the boundary line adjustment process begins? That's it for me. My question, that was just a comment and something to think about. Okay, uh, Ms. Watts. Um, thank you. I have, uh, uh, Ms. Catron Ms. Catron you asked a couple of my questions, um, specifically Oakland Mills Middle School. I think everybody is wondering um, how far, it, so it's, it's 2023 plus. So it doesn't even mean that this is gonna happen in 20, 2032, sorry, 2032 and beyond. So I, I think we're wondering when the, reno when the renovations at Oakland Mills Middle School will happen. Um, so I'll leave that as a comment. Um, I did have a question about the regional, the regional um, early childhood centers. Um, we have some land banks and they are like nine to 11 um, acres. Um, what is the size that we would need or the acreage we would need for the um, construction? I would assume it's full construction that you're proposing uh, for the, the regional early childhood centers. We right now would be in the initial steps of seeing what the actual requirements would be. We would work with the individual departments to determine what the actual demonstrated need would be. Uh, it is our initial belief that that nine or 10 acres would be sufficient uh, to put in a regional center. Uh, another option that we have looked at is potentially the property at the Faulkner Ridge uh, School. We asked, also have that property in uh, Columbia area as well. Okay. Are there any like building requirements for f that you're thinking of for that center? I understand like the, the nine to 10 acres, but what are you like in the development of the building? What are you expecting it to hold? Like what's the capacity, the number of classrooms? Uh, is it going to be one story, two story? Like I, I want to know how many people, how many, what, what's the anticipated relief you would expect from a center? Those are really going to be questions that would be answered when we work with the individual programs. What we did look at um, specifically in the Columbia area when we looked at the Faulkner Ridge Center is that we could renovate that facility to get potentially 15 to 20 classrooms, which would get us 15 to 20 classrooms for capacity in our existing schools. Um, as we move to other southwest uh, properties, because that's primarily where our, our land bank is, it's really going to depend on the the need that the individual programs define. The building itself would be governed by a lot of our existing code. While it still is used for a school, the age of these students would be much younger, which puts us into another category. So we would take the, that into account as well at that point. Um, are there regional programs that don't involve that don't involve like the um the younger kids, like their regional programs for uh, older students that we could also pull into that same building? Potentially, yes. There are regional programs similar to the ALS program or the ED program. But those are um, individual programs we would work with uh, Dr. Savage and her team to determine if they would be best to be left in the schools or if they could also be pulled into, potentially pulled into regional program centers. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, Ms. Mosley. Hello, thanks for the report. I think you know what my first comment's gonna go about because some of us have already hit on it. Um, I want to point out that once again, the Oakland Mills community has been suggested to be pushed off to avoid redistricting. And the cost of this is that Oakland Mills Middle School is continuing to not have their renovations and their building isn't a healthy building. And this is a school that provides an education, a wonderful education to some of our, um, some of our students in that school have high rates of, um, you know, has high percentage of farm students. 
and they also all um, be pro the, they are also are I'm getting tired I'm sorry they are also all promoted to Oakland Mills High School which is another school that has held a ton of deferred maintenance for our county schools. And to suggest that we want to push off renovations at Oakland Mills Middle School because of, to avoid redistricting, because I can see that Lake Elkhorn Middle School, Oakland Mills Middle School, all have capacities in your um, 2021 maps and your 2030 maps. And those schools, you know, there's a group of Thomas Viaduct Middle School that feeds into Oakland Mills High School. So it's even the same feeder structure. And it's really disappointing to me that the school system would suggest that a brand new school get a renovation to avoid redistricting when there is capacity at existing schools, ex specifically at existing schools that have been waiting for renovations because of deferred maintenance. I think that is a major problem. And it's the second time tonight that we have seen Oakland Mills having to wait more for stability. And I think it's a big problem. So that's one comment. My other comment is going back to these regional centers. Um, can we use existing buildings that exist in our community already? Can we look at using um, village centers or adding, adding planning in, um, the planning of renovation of our um, village centers, which is happening to include um, education centers or these regional spaces, as well as using office spaces that exist or even shopping spaces that exist, similar to how daycare and private schools have already are using these types of spaces for their programs. Yes, ma'am, uh, that would be a possibility. And those have been ideas that have been discussed previously and they could be strategies that we continue to explore as we move forward, yes. Thank you. Okay, I'm Lex. So first I wanna concur with Ms. Mosley about the regional center. I, I hope we're not just try to push to build more because we don't have money. We need the money in other places. If we can rent some community centers to house the regional program, I think that'd be great. I just hope but next year we have feasibility study. We're not to talk about. The, uh, we're considering that, or instead you will bring up some proposal, some solutions. Okay, this is what proposed. We're going to rent some facilities because just by renting facility, it take time to sign the contract, find the, find the location, find the need, find the location, sign the contract, possible sign the contract. It takes a long time. Now, how about we really go that direction to really liberate some capacity in the school. That's one question I hope. I'm not sure how we're moving forward, but do we need to give direction to the superintendent or to your office? That's something I'm interested to know. Uh, thank you for the question, Dr. Wu. I don't believe we need direction. Uh, there has been discussions through multiple divisions in the school system um, with regards to the regional centers and doing a study to determine multiple different aspects. One aspect is what the actual need is. And then the other aspect is what are possibilities and strategies exactly as you as the board are mentioning, either utilizing existing facilities, building new facilities, or even taking a look at our village centers. So mm -hmm. that is something we have discussed and we will continue to move forward with. I think it's because financial aspect is, is critical important, critical important, right? If we have the money, we have land available. It's really, we don't have enough money right now. So that's the reason I really encourage you to explore that. And next time when we discuss this issue, you are able to provide some solutions. Uh, instead, we said we're considering that. I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm too ambitious, but I think it's important. And. Uh, Second question, I think, come back to the land bank, right? I see there are several land banks, majority of them kind of not big. And uh, I hope like, we need to consider building a new elementary school in the future. And we began to explore new school models, right? Like bigger, not bigger, larger and higher, right? I think I talk about this a few times. And I don't hope. I don't wish like when next time we need to build a school, we say, oh, well, we don't have time to consider different models. We can only use the existing model. 
which is, you know, we have less and less land available, and we have more and more development coming online, and more schools will get crowded. I'm not sure how long it takes to be, like, create a model as a company, but I, I hope you will be put that in, in your desk, right? Next time when we talk about this again, you said, okay, if we need to build a new high elementary school in f three years, when do we need that, that design, right? We're not able to just use the existing school models. Yet. Maybe we need to change that because we don't have bigger land available anymore, right? So that's another task. I hope we're doing something. I think the third one is about the 2025 plan. I just feel that's not realistic at all. So let's, let's look at that again. In 2025, we said we have a new elementary school, 43, and Thomas Vada have an addition because I don't think we have money beyond the 2023 right now. Where everything is kind of 2023, and we have only two years, 2020, 2024, 2025. It takes more than two years to build a school, right? I remember that. So I think we don't have money be before 2023. I just wonder, how do we make a, like a prediction for 2025? We have one new elementary school and an addition for Tom and Vadok. So how do we come out to that de decision? Well, I'd like Mr. Rogers to expand on this a little bit, but I, I would like to just start by saying that what you see on slide 12, which is the blue box chart, and it, I believe is on page uh, 16 in the feasibility study, this is showing the strategy, the needs and the A strategy to go forward and where those needs are. The feasibility study then informs the capital budget. So the CIP is where we start to take a look at what is actually possible based off of our fiscal constraints. What you are saying, Dr. Wu, is very important and we definitely hear you. Um, and that is something that we will be taking into consideration as we continue to work on our next fiscal year 2023 capital budget and going forward. Uh, Tim, would you like to expand a little bit more on the, the needs and strategies in the feasibility study? Uh, sure, thanks, Mr. Lubley. Um, Tim Rogers, Office of School Planning. Uh, elementary 43 is identified as early as it is in these recommendations. Again, like Mr. Lubley said, based on uh, projected need, and that need is driven by um, some of the larger residential developments um, that most of you, if not all, are aware of um, taking place in the southeast portion of the county. So um, what we've projected, and, and this is uh, summarized on page 30 of the feasibility study at the elementary level, is a, um, a utilization in that area of 101% in school year 2021-22 and a projected utilization uh, by school year 2030 of 116% with approximately 550 seats there needed to keep that area, that grouping of schools um, at 100% through that 2030 timeline. So that being the highest and most immediate need at the elementary school level, um, that's what drove the, the recommendation um, to, to uh, have that elementary school provided as early as it is. But like Mr. Lubley said, um, you know, this is, these recommendations are based on, on, on need only. I see. Um, and the okay. Next, the so, next phase, yeah, they inform the, the okay. uh, next phases and the budgeting phase. I see. It's kind of aspirational. Is that the right word? Uh, I think you could characterize it that way. It's, it's driven by the enrollment projections and the needs identified. And then because if I look at 2024, everything is asked. If I look at 2024, download the middle school, right? If we said that we need audition available, it takes two years. Is that right? Two, at least two years, right? So that means when you start build at 2022, right? And uh, right now, I think the funding is just frozen there. We just don't see any extra funding comes in. That's a difficult part, I would say. If we just look at aspirational, then we come back to Ms. Watts and Ms. Mosley and Ms. Cortonio about Oakland Middle High School and Oakland Middle School. I think that probably even pushed away by further, not 2032. It's a really unfortunate situation we're facing. My last point is about 
development polygon. So I, I think we talk about this idea. I'm not sure whether the board have a consensus. So I just want to talk about this tonight. And uh, because I always feel if a, if a family come to a housing, they expect they go to their neighboring school. And once they settle down, they build a relationship in their neighborhood. And if in the future we say, oh, I'm sorry, I need to move you away. Instead, if we inform that because your neighborhood school has been overcrowded, we inform them earlier. So they know when they purchase the house, they may not attend their neighborhood school if their neighborhood school is crowded. I feel that's easier for the school board and easier for your job. So if we develop a polygon, especially for large housing development, for example, the turkey farm, right? 500 units. And uh, if we say, I'm sorry, your neighboring school, actually your current assigned schools are overcrowded. I want to move you to a- Bushy Park. <laughs> not a bushy park, but a, a neighbor school, which is less overcrowded, right? That can help them and help us. And at least I think if we have a redistribution, we're not facing a strong opposition as what we had before, because we informed them. And uh, so for your office, if we say we want your office to develop an idea how develop Polygon, like started and exited, then exit, I mean, when the, their neighboring school come back to normal, then they can move back to their neighboring school. So do we need a motion from the board to develop that, or your office can do that yourself? Uh, that's definitely a, a conversation that has been had with the board and we have had within our office. Um, we will continue to have that conversation and we have actually had it with uh, the Howard County Department of Planning and Zoning as well. I think initially there were two considerations that the board definitely should take uh, heed of when we talk about the development polygons is as Dr. Wu, you pointed out, when a development comes on and if that development is then moved off to another development or another school, it, it removes them from their community school. And that's one thing that we have heard a lot about when we look at our redistricting plans is keeping the integrity of the community school. So that's something that the board would definitely have to weigh in this conversation. The other item that would need to be considered is the effect the potential effect on APFO. When you take a look at APFO and the school closure charts, that starts to address the availability and the um, housing allocations for new developments. And as soon as we start to let the um, construction industry or the residential development industry know that even if a school is closed, we may move students somewhere else that opens up that question and starts to question about how APFO will actually operate. And if that still complies with the intent of APFO or completely changes it. So, so the question about APFO, APFO, I think I thought about that. I think the issue of that is even they continue to build in the neighboring school, the school could even open more crowded, right? So it doesn't matter to build here or the other place. It's really just to try to even out the overcrowdedness because overall we're open in general, right? The elementary, middle school, and high school is more than 100%, is that right? Yes, sir. It, yeah. it, it, we're getting to the point where um, it's become, it would become much more difficult to keep doing redistricting because as a county, we're running out of seats Mm -hmm. Overall, so you said it should be the board, board make make a suggestion to develop this idea. Uh, we can definitely take a look and try and de uh, develop or come up with a an idea of how the development polygons uh, would look. Since like your office doesn't meet us very frequently, I just wonder like if you were you're working on that. Like what, what's your timeline can bring that forward to the board for discussion? 
Uh, I'd like to uh, go over that with uh, Mr. Washington and Mr. Rogers, knowing that right now the Office of School Planning is down to only two people. Mm -hmm. I don't want to necessarily overtax them currently. It is something that we will pay attention to and work on. Um, at the minimum, we can look at the development polygons and create at least a board memo, if not a, a more formalized report to come back through Dr. Martirano to the Board of Education. Correct, Mr. Lubley, uh, Scott Washington, Chief Operating Officer. Dr. Will, we do not need a director from the board to examine it. That is something that we'll take upon ourselves that we're examining on our own. I know the conversation has come up enough in the past that we know it needs to be done with that. We will work together with that and also get with Dr. Martirano accordingly and come back to the board with that information. Okay, thank you. So I just want, like, this will not just have only had this discussion. We have some results, right? And uh, eventually the board can look at that and help us plan for, for the future. That's what I'm looking forward. I really appreciate that, Mr. Washington, to weigh in. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, now it's uh, Dr. Liu. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is about slide number seven, that is projection accuracy. So I understand that you also reported um, uh, January 21st, 2021. In that report, you also have um, the accuracy by school. I wonder whether you have the similar graph projection accuracy uh, by calendar year by each school, so we can see how accurate the projections are for each school. Uh, Dr. Liu, thanks for that question. Tim Rogers, school planning again. Um, that is something we could pull together. It's not something we typically report out, but we, uh, it's something we could pull together and provide to the board. Yeah, thank you. The reason sure. why I'm asking is if some schools, their uh, projection got underestimated or overestimated, and then when we got, basically they cancel each other out. So it's difficult to see the trend, but if we detect some trend in certain schools, for example, if they're consistently being uh, underestimated or overestimated, it helps us detect the trend. And of course, for this COVID-19, it has an impact on the projection. So we'll be able to see what is the long-term impact and the short-term impact about COVID-19 on uh, projection accuracy by school. So that'll be very helpful for our future uh, redistricting things. We are going to have high school number 13 pretty soon and we will be having another school redistricting. Um, and my other question is, um, due to COVID, many businesses chose to teleworking. So we have some vacancy in existing buildings. So that is uh, similar to other board members' um, suggestions. So whether we'll be able to explore in that opportunity and because those existing buildings, if they're vacant, probably they're willing to offer us a discount rate for lease or renting. Understood, ma'am, and that's, as I noted, that's something we can definitely take a look at uh, with the regional programs. Uh, one consideration that we'll include in that review is the difference between providing the a new facility or a renovation through capital funds versus a lease which would be a continual expense in the operating budget so we'll make sure to include that in our review okay thank you that's all i have and looks miss thomas moore well i have to say i'm very excited that we're discussing development polygons because as as Dr. Martirano and others know, I have been asking to want to do this for years. And I appreciate um, the two concerns that have been raised by staff. However, I would like to point out, I appreciate that, you know, that we're looking at, you know, there's APFO and it could mess APFO up, but I also would like to make the very obvious observation, APFO is not working. So we shouldn't provide APFO all of this, I don't even know what to call it, reverence? When it, is, when it in fact is not doing the job it is meant to do because the challenge that we have as the school system is we are caught in the middle between the county council who provides us money for construction and the county council whose are the only decisions that impact zoning and development in the county. So we have to figure out some way to mitigate this and I believe this is why the development polygon method will work. Because if you look back when developers wanna develop an APVO, 
they always go to and say, well, the school system can redistrict. That is the way the school system is supposed to be operating. Well, they like redistricting. Development polygons is just redistricting. So they should be thrilled that we're looking at doing this. And we could even explore that the developers can help pay for the buses to transport the children because it is a defined community. They will go into that school. And if capacity opens up at a later point in time, then we can re move, then we can move the, the students to where the capacity exists. Because the, con the issue is that we keep moving the students who, all, who are already in the system. And it's not, it's just not right, it isn't. There's this old phrase of last in, first out. And I think we have to look at it this way because we have to do something. Because I appreciate that we are looking at when we're gonna put more elementary schools and you know everyone talks about high school 14. We all just went through the budget process on the capital side. I don't know where this money is going to come from. We don't have money for deferred maintenance. We don't, we don't have money for anything. So I mean, I think it's great, but we have to look at ways to mitigate. And I think part of what we can do to help do that is if we can, if our folks in our part of this equation can find a way how we can better reflect and project the number of students who are coming from new construction. And we do it in a way that is transparent so that we can show this impact. Because I was so thrilled to see this conversation beginning, thank you Mrs. Catronio, for us bringing it to the forefront that just counting the students for the first year is not an accurate way to project how many students we are going to be getting from a development. So I think the other thing that I th would, be gr would be useful, we have the technology, hopefully, that you can provide to us the number of students who are coming from these different developments and do it by polygon so that we can get down into the nitty gritty of where the students are and how they're coming. Um, the other issue I wanted to bring up was I think it would also be helpful if we could overlay the attendance area maps on the Plan Howard 2030. And we can try to reconcile what our, popu our student population looks like with how the county is looking to do rev revitalization. And I would also suggest that to my two colleagues who are on committees that are dealing with this current issue, that that information be brought to them as well. Because I think it would help give additional knowledge as to what we're, how the land decisions are impacting the school decisions. Because right now, they're kind of both in their own little world. And I guess is to also what Dr. Wu was saying, we have to try to solve a problem that we really don't have control over and figure out what we can do with the students. Because especially with elementary school, I believe I think the calculation of the number of pre-K pre students is 1,300 1, countywide. If we could relocate them at a center, that would help us on the elementary end. But again, there are costs to doing that as well. So since luckily we are not redistricting this year, but it is coming sooner as opposed to later, I would like to put a question to staff. Is there anything that you feel the board should be discussing or that we should be looking at prior to us getting to that point? Just to clarification, uh, prior to that point, you mean meaning the redistricting? Yes. Uh, any preparatory work that the board can do obviously helps. I believe there was a good amount of preparatory discussion through the 2019 work sessions, uh, which resulted in the probability maps that we came up with. Uh, we all know that it, as we take a look at high school 13 and we do the boundary reviews for high school 13, there are implications at the middle school and even potentially elementary school level. 
So those are items that we all could be looking at and, and getting ready for that as well. Mr. Rogers, do you have any suggestions? Um, I, I don't at this time. Um, however, I, I think that um, discussions are, are ongoing uh, regarding um, some sessions with board members to learn more about the enrollment projection and redistricting processes. And I, I look forward to uh, meeting with board members in the near future and discussing our processes and our, uh, our methodologies with them uh, in these two areas. Thank you. And I would encourage my board, my fellow board members to also start thinking about the data that you're going to want to want that you're going to want to use to help inform your decisions and your calculations. And maybe if we could start getting some of those ideas um, to staff now that we can do some preliminary work on that. I know this may seem really early, but it's going to come up much faster, I think, than any of us want. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Marlow. I have some probably, hopefully, really easy questions. Can you re remind us what the uh, estimate is to renovate Fulton Ridge? Ballpark estimate. If you give me one second, I can definitely let you know that. Based off of the current state construction for uh, building only, it would be approximately $20 million to renovate that facility. And that would be for construction uh, only. As we take a look at the total project cost, we'd have to take into account the design fees, the related cost contingency, and fixture furnishing and equipment as well. So one of the big things in here is this need to potentially look at regional centers um, to house pre-k rec programs make programs all of that how and i know there was a figure for how many students we currently have enrolled what is the total number of classrooms that we are that were looked at when talking about the growth, the potential for building out regional centers. Is it only the 1,300 students or with Kerwin, is it more? Our initial discussions were based off of what we currently see in the uh, program and specifically looking at the individual regions but the discussion has continued with looking forward as well. As you're pointing out, um, we continually hear year after year that the regional programs continue to grow. So we would definitely want to take into account that growth and plan as we're moving forward with a potential project for a regional program center. So this, when we look at Kerwin, I believe Kerwin mandated universal pre-K, which we currently estimate that pre-K, uh, any class K to 12 right now is about 4,000 students. How many classrooms and regional centers would we need to accommodate all of that pre-K? I don't have those figures off the top of my head right now. Uh, as I said, in the Faulkner Ridge, we were looking at about 15 to 20 classrooms, depending on the size. I would have to touch base with the individual programs to see what their ratio of students per teacher and ratio of students per classroom is to give you that information. I think that's important to share with the board as moving forward, because when we're if we're talking about 15 classrooms, that's a very different scenario than talking about 60 classrooms. Um, and then I assume we don't yet have a sense, but ha did the Kerwin pre-K mandate come with funding for construction? Or is it like Thornton when they universal? 
said mandating universal kindergarten and didn't provide any funding. I, I don't believe that the Kerwin Commission provides funding specifically for construction. Okay. Do we know what the timeline is for pre-K capacity? I, I do not have that information, ma'am, no. Okay. Do we know what a timeline is for school prototype design? Yes, uh, as Mr. Washington noted in previous conversations, when we brought forth to the board the new lit, the policy 6030 list for architects, our direction for those architects in their interview was to start taking a look at what's called an archetype. And the difference between an archetype and a prototype is a prototype really as we all understand it is a static facility. It's the same facility that's built one after the other with slight modifications. The archetype is more looking at the individual pieces that are needed within a facility and they're consistent through facility, but it's a design basis that can change based off of the parameters of the site. So we have already started that conversation. And as we move into our next designs for uh, Dunlog and or for rather for ES 43, that would be one of the very initial conversations that we have with the architect that is chosen is what is going to be the best design for this facility that doesn't necessarily follow our prototype, but provides the same modular um, spaces that are required, but for the best for our future and for the that site. I hope that answers the question. I'm glad the, the conversation. Absolutely. So I'm glad that. So basically, the timeline's already started on developing, talking to our architects about developing an archetype as opposed to a prototype. And that's fantastic. And I'm really glad to hear it because I know it came up a couple months ago. So um, in looking at page 16 and that blue chart that listed, done login in 2024. I, um, I want our community to realize that if we were planning to open a done login expansion in 2024, wouldn't we have needed to have started it already? Yes, ma'am. Again, the, the archetypes and prototypes Yes, ma'am. As Dr. Wu Design noted, phase. it takes several years to actually construct, and it even takes uh, at least a year prior to that, um, closer to 18 months with design and bid to get it going. So, yes, if we were looking to open it in 2024, we would be in the process right now. And I, again, just want to uh, reiterate that the schedule that's laid out here is based off of need and strategy. and. It's a, a informer or a resource that goes into the capital planning process. So both the, the funding and the actual the timing is, of the projects, understanding what you're saying, yes, the deadline for the for the 24, we would have to be in that right now. You are correct. So the, the bottom line is this is where we might potentially like to go, but we're nowhere near this. And and I, I do want our community to be aware. Sometimes when they see the feasibility study, they think, oh, that means we're getting our renovation in 2024. It, and it's certainly Oakland Mills has thought time and again, oh, we're in that feasibility study. We must be getting a renovation. Um, and I do want to reiterate or reinforce that I too, join Ms. Mosley and others who think that putting off a renovation of Oakland Mills Middle in order just to avoid redistricting is untenable. Those students deserve and need a renovated school. And if we have to make that a capacity project, then we make that the capacity project rather than put additions onto an already small school site. Um, so I, I am concerned that 
were that we have a limited number of options, but that's clear. It's been clear for a number of years. Um, but thank you for all the work put into this. I know it's a lot of long-term planning and crystal ball gazing, and it's pretty challenging. So we appreciate all you do um, to the Office of School Planning, the op operations, school construction. Thank you. Is this is a lot, and we know that. And and unfortunately, we always feel like we're criticizing because we want everything done yesterday because we want the best for our students and our staff. So, you know, realize that we're coming at this from a, a place that I'm, you, we're sure you are too, that you would like to be able to have unlimited money to renovate Oakland Mills Middle and build new. So, thank you. And Ms. Mallow, once again, Scott Washington, Chief Operating Officer, just to emphasize, I know Mr. Lubley said it a number of times, the CIP that, and the capital budget that has been improved shows the projects where they currently sit right now. And that is the projects based off the funding. That's the projects based off the schedule. That's where we are. What we're looking at here is simply looking at the needs, as has been expressed a number of times. If we don't show the needs, people will just want to understand what the needs are. And this just informs that capital budget. This has not put a project in front of another project. This has not superseded the project, but this is showing where the needs are. And we're just trying to do that balance that we have to do with that, which is which is which is very which is very challenging at times. But the capital budget that has been approved, the capital budget is in place, that shows the projects as they sit and as a land at this time and this again this document has to show need we have to at least show the needs of the system thank you mr washington and uh, i i think i want to echo what miss Mallow said we are not crit criticizing your office or anywhere anybody we just want to talk about this and uh, see how we can move forward i have one question about the land purchase or school side, what's the status for Turbo Valley school side and the status for high school 14 side? Uh, currently, the Turf Valley site is still um, being purchased by the county. That was a point of discussion with the county council and uh, the real estate services through this capital or through the budget process. Um, as they are looking to continue to purchase that site is my understanding they do not currently own it, uh, but they are looking to continue that purchase. As far as the High School 14 site, that discussion has been uh, ongoing with regards to the site to be potentially the Troy Park location. We are continuing to work with Rec and Parks uh, to proceed with that discussion. Part of the initial discussion is that part of that property was purchased with program open space. So we are continuing to work with the county and their departments to resolve any potential um, issues with regards to the department or with regards to, to the program open space in that site. So do you think that there's obstacles for high school 14 site? I would say n not any more than a normal project. Um, any construction project or land purchase is going to have considerations. I wouldn't call them obstacles. Um, it's just items that we have to continue to review and work with with the uh, county departments. I see. Thank you. Do we have other board members have questions? Do you see your hand? OK. Ms. Cotonio. Echoing my colleagues' comments, I'm not criticizing you, any, even though sometimes it seems like it. Um, I'm not at all, and I think you're wonderful partners. At, we both have the same goals. Um, I want to clarify, when we're talking about the regional programs, we're just are we talking just the pre-K programs, the early childhood programs? For the regional locations? Mr. Rogers? Yeah. Can clarify. Yeah, sure, Ms. Catroni. I think we're I think we're primarily talking about those programs because they are like Mr. Lubley alluded to earlier, the programs that that um, impact our elementary school capacities the most. Um, however, I, I think as this conversation evolves regarding these centers, if there are opportunities to 
um, provide regional locations for um, other programs, ALS, ED, uh, I would, and others in, in, the, in that I spectrum? I would struggle with that, separating special ed students into, yep. you know, out away from sure. schools. Um, and so I just, I think that that needs to be discussed if that, if we go, and I know we're a long way off, but that really just raises some flags for me. And I, d I think the early childhood um, regional programs, totally appropriate. And we could have, I know we have the palace program and that sort of thing, but to separate out the school age children from their peers um, into regional programs, I, I, I think there's a problem with that. Um, when we're get, getting back to the new construction yields, I wonder if there's a way that we can add, a, you know, for the next feasibility study or whatever, um, that level of data, like the it, actual enrollment from some of our bigger, um, newer developments, so that people have an idea of how the actual impact on enrollment, that they're not just looking at the number 23 as the student yield for that year, um, it could be a certain, you know, a minimum of units, but just our bigger projects. I'm just wondering if that would be a possibility to go along with the new student yields, just the comparison, because the difference is stark, and I think it would be very informative. Um, so just something to think about. I don't know, we can talk offline further about it, what it would look like and what would be helpful, but I just think it would, it would um, help inform the community as to, as to what actual numbers we're dealing with. Um, and then, the, my third, can't read my own writing. Um, we will be, dis uh, just to let the public know if anyone is still listening, we will be discussing this at, we have a joint session with County Council on Monday morning at 9.30 and it will be streamed live that you can watch. We'll be discussing this and many other topics, but this, the feasibility study is, is not big on the agenda. Um, I think that's it. Oh. Last point, I think you, you've picked up that we're not really fans of taking Oakland Mills Middle um, off the, um, or um, moving it down the list and that, or even to just add capacity to Thomas Viaduct. I think that we, I know most of my colleagues feel that that capacity should be added to Oakland Mills and we will be redistricting next year and that will be an option um, to look at. So I, I think, um, Hopefully you've picked up on that, that, that it's very, um, it's troublesome to, to us to um, defer Oakland Mills Middle even further down the line and to Dun Dunlagan Middle. That's it for me, thank you. Okay, Ms. Thomas Moore. I just wanna reiterate what my colleague said about um, isolating special education programs, that those are not the regional programs, I believe that we should be moving out of our schools. Um, the other issue I wanted to bring up was, um, Yields from apartments and townhouses as another issue that I think we should have further discussion on and looking at that. Um, how do we, do we change them every year based on historical information or do we more or less keep the yields the same from year to year? Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Delon Small. We, we do update all of the data in our projection every year. So, um, as you may remember, each of the factors, uh, housing factors that we consider um, as a data point that we collect either from student data, um, county agencies, state agencies, and uh, every year we update those historical yield rates, adding the most recent year um, to the sample that we have to work with to inform the future uh, enrollment projections. Have we gotten to a point of being able to do yield rates based on individual apartments, apartment complexes? Um, that is something that we could we could study, um, but since we could, we project enrollment at the school level, um, we find that it's it's most useful to uh, aggregate this data at the school level in order to ensure adequate sample sizes, but. I will say that looking at different yield rates from different types of apartments is something we're, we're considering and would like to do in future studies. Yeah, and I, I, you know I've been saying for years the fact that we're not looking at the numbers in the polygons and then moving up as opposed to taking the number in the school and then <laughs> pushing that down to the polygons. I mean, I... I would like to see how it would look if, you know, take at least maybe one or two attendance attendance areas and look and see how the numbers really settle themselves out. 
if how we are projecting what the per pupil is per polygon as opposed to look what the actual per pupil is per polygon. Because, I mean, as we progress, and I understand sample size and all that, but clearly not as well as Dr. Liu, but I think that it bears additional discussion because there used to be this whole theory in this county that, well, people in apartments and townhouses don't have children, and clearly that was not the proper assumption. And um, the other issue that we do have, and as the economy um, doesn't go in the most positive direction, we're going to have more families where what would be considered a single family dwelling, there are gonna be more multiples in those, those houses. So that is also, or apartments. So that is also gonna start skewing, um, I believe, as we continue to move forward. So I look forward to further discussions with the staff. And yeah. also, thank you very much for all your work. Okay. Mr. Delmont Small, I think I think Dr. Savage had a clarification about one of the questions you just asked about the um, special ed programs. If she could just say something real brief. Of course. Oh, thank you, uh, Mr. Washington. Um, good evening, uh, Dr. Wu, other members of the board, Superintendent Martirano. Uh, this is Terry Savage, Executive Director for Special Education. And I did just want to follow on briefly to what Mr. Lubley and Mr. Rogers lifted up with regard to the Early Childhood Center um, model. We have uh, been engaging in um, quite a few discussions around what the possibilities might be. And as they alluded to, um, we do plan to have further discussion about how to maximize our resources at the early intervention level for services. So we are absolutely not thinking about um, uh, movement of our school age programs um, into that type of model. Certainly that would um, impact um, the least restrictive environment options for those students and specific to those students. And we want to facilitate efforts where we maintain our inclusivity within the district. So we are definitely um, considering initially the early intervention services, um, including our assessment services model and how, to, how we bring all those uh, teachers and providers together under one roof to maximize the, the um, services and also increase our bandwidth. Well, thank you very, very much for making that clarification. Sure. And also for the fact that you are having these discussions and you are thinking towards how we can change things and make things better for our students and our educators. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Savage and Mr. Washington, Mr. Lubley and uh, Mr. Rogers. And this concludes the discussion on the feasibility study. Now we come to the board members report. So board members, if